greatest wishes is to communicate with the dead. And there are popular psychics today that skeptics refer to as grief vampires. And they find people who are trapped in some place of non-acceptance concerning the death of a loved one. And then they claim to be able to provide reconnection and reassurance and all for a modest fee of thousands and thousands of dollars. Now, one of the most popular psychics today actually comes from the Central Valley. He's known as the Hollywood medium. He's a young man named Tyler Henry. If you've ever been flipping through the channels, you might have seen him on the E! channel. Now, every alleged medium and psychic has one thing in common, and that is that they cannot pass any real scientific scrutiny. Skeptics say that this ability they claim to have is really a skill called cold reading, where people with some degree of intuition and good observation skills are able to fool the unsuspecting with high probability guesses based on their intuition of the observations that they've made. And cold reading has been used by magicians and fortune tellers for centuries. Cold readers can quickly pick up on subtle signs and they begin to intuit possible explanations for what they're observing. And then they start to express what it is they have observed and they quickly also pick up on whether they are on the right track or not. And if they're not on the right track, then they change course very quickly. If they make any right guesses, which eventually they all seem to do, all the wrong guesses they made are quickly forgotten, as if it never happened. Psychologists believe that this appears to work because the cold reader masquerading as a psychic merely confirms the biases of the person who has come for the reading. They at some point intuit correctly what this person actually wants them to say. And the simple truth of the matter is that many magicians can easily duplicate what these so-called psychics claim is a real ability. And a good magician can fool even the smartest of people. They can amaze people with their seeming ability to read minds, to identify the contents of hidden messages and drawings and things like that. Of course, we all know if these magicians and psychics actually possessed any real ability, they would not be doing holiday parties. They would be out there winning the lottery or finding a cure for some terrible disease. Charlatans have been around for a long time, and sometimes their deception can last for a long time. In modern times, the family that brought this to America is a family known as the John Fox family. In the early 1800s, they moved uh, to Hydesville, New York. John Fox's two youngest daughters, Margaret and Kate, began to hear these inexplicable knockings in various parts of the house. Young Kate tried to contact the spirit world, which, which was causing all this commotion, allegedly. When she snapped her fingers, the spirit would knock in response, on cue. And Kate and Margaret devised a way to communicate with the spirit world by coded wrappings. And they said they had contacted a spirit named Charles Rosma, who supposedly had been murdered by a former tenant. And when they later found portions of a human skeleton in the fox's cellar, the Fox sisters gain worldwide attention. Sounds like maybe they should have been investigating the Foxes for other things, but anyway, they found these human remains in the cellar and they said, oh, these girls, they really truly have this ability. And scientists of that day came and investigated the Fox sisters and they were perplexed. They could never explain these strange knockings. The famous New York editor, Horace Greeley, also came and he went away completely baffled. And after a mere 86 years, the Fox sisters finally acknowledged that they were frauds and that they had produced the strange sound of the knockings by, wait for it, cracking their toe joints. That's how they did it. They cracked their toe joints and apparently they could crack them so loud, it sounded like knockings. And when they went to theaters to perform this, 
Margaret would stand up on a table, Kate would ask questions, and then Margaret would crack her toes in response to Kate's questions, and people were, they were believing it. Now, despite the fraud that is discovered again and again in spiritism, people are continually drawn to it for some reason. And unfortunately, in today's text, King Saul seeks reassurance from a person who claims to be able to speak to the dead. Now, before we get into that, David also finds himself suffering the consequences of his insipid plan to fix his own problems, as it turns out, as it usually does. When we try to fix our own problems, we just make matters worse, and that's exactly what he does. So let's turn our Bibles to chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. Beginning in verse 1, we read, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. You ever find out that sometimes your deception has worked just a little too well? And so it is with David. He had tried to convince this king of the Philistines, Achish, of his loyalty to him and his estrangement from Israel by lying about the rage that he was going on, suggesting that he was raiding the enemies of the Philistines, when in fact he was actually raiding the enemies of Israel. And unfortunately for David, Achish is now convinced. So much so that Achish thinks David will now follow him even into battle against the nation of Israel. Achish's desire to fight Israel might even be based upon David's defection to the Philistine territory. He must think, wow, if one of their top military persons is now coming to my territory, this might be a good time to go fight the nation of Israel. And David gives this very weird response to what Achish says in verse 2. Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. What, what does he mean? That's somewhat ambiguous. Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now, whatever David actually meant, Achish takes the remark as consent and promotes David on the spot. Things are getting even worse for David. It promotes him to his main bodyguard. And these two verses actually set up chapter 29. But again, we find this principle at play that once our sin starts like a rock rolling downhill, it gains momentum with each and every bound it takes, which brings us to someone who's on a real downward slide, and that is Saul. Verse 3, now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah, and Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came up and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets." Dreams are sometimes used by God to reveal his will. The Urim was something, uh, a part of something called the Urim and the Thummim, which was used by the high priest to determine the will of God, presumably by giving these yes or no answers to simple questions. We don't actually know what that was. There's a lot of speculation. There's different colored stones, and they tossed them, and if different colors came up, that was a yes, and other colors was a no, things like that. Anyway, we do know that they used it to determine the will of God, and obviously prophets could reveal the will of God. Nevertheless, Saul and his inquiry, the Lord does not answer him through any of these means. He doesn't answer him by dreams. He doesn't answer him by the Urim. And of course, the greatest prophet of Israel at the time, Samuel, is now dead. So Saul thinks, well, why, that, why should that stop me? I'll figure out a way to talk to Samuel anyway. So once doubt enters your mind, just like we talked about last week, fear starts giving you direction. Saul is terrified. He's having doubts about what's in store in his future. So in desperation, fear leads him to embark on this course that becomes in essence his final act of defiance. Verse 7, Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium. Apparently, he didn't want large or extra large. He was very specific, had to be a medium. So I may go and inquire of her. And they said, there is one in indoor. Isn't it interesting how quickly they answer him? He supposedly has banished all spiritists, which was the male version, and the mediums, which was the female version. 
he supposedly banished all these people from the land. And so he asked his men, hey, where can I find a, a woman who's a medium? And right away, they know where to find one. It's kind of suspicious. Verse 8, so Paul disguised him, or Saul rather, disguised himself, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up the name of the one, uh, bring up the one for me that I name. And the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? So she's worried this might be a sting operation of some kind. She's being in trap. And then Saul, just to show what level he's descended to, swore to her by the Lord. Saul is swearing by the Lord whom he's defying to convince her it's okay to proceed with something the Lord forbids. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried at the top of her voice and said, Samuel, or said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now, what actually happened here? It's kind of mysterious. There's a lot of speculation. Some people think this woman is a complete fraud. And she's just planning on deceiving Saul through an ancient practice called ventriloquism. That she's going to use ventriloquism to pretend to have the spirit of Samuel and tell Saul whatever it is she wants to tell him. Apparently, it's like she's some kind of Jeff Dunham and Samuel is some kind of ancient Walter. Now, the word ventriloquism comes from the Latin to speak from the stomach. The Greeks actually had another word for this. They called it gastromancy. Now, I'm guessing Jeff Dunham is glad that that didn't catch on. I mean, with all the fun people have making fun of ventriloquists, imagine the fun they would have making fun of gastromancists. So the people believe that the noises produced by the stomach were actually the voices of the unliving. And the ventriloquists would then allow the dead to speak through them. To the ventriloquist, this was just a deceptive trick to fool people. So some people think she might have been a fraud, and that's what she was planning to do. Others believe she is the real deal, but that she could only conjure up not the actual spirit of the person, but she conjured up a demonic spirit who would then impersonate the person requested. So now we've gone from an ancient Jeff Dunham and a Walter routine to an ancient Frank Caliendo or Rich Little routine. And so she would conjure up this demon and this demon would pretend to be whoever she wanted them to pretend to be. But still others believe whether she was a fake or not, thanks to God's intervention on this particular occasion, this very unique occasion, she actually got Samuel dead and in person and it scared the bejeebers out of her. Please note the passage never claims that this is anything but Samuel, never explains that it is anything else but Samuel. So this woman was either prepared to throw her voice with some fancy gastromancy, or she was ready to conjure up this demon, and God let the real Samuel on this one occasion come up. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Now, it's unclear if Saul could see Samuel or only hear him. It kind of looks like maybe he could only hear him. It's not really clear. Verse 15 Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. And Samuel said, why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy, why do you consult me? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey 
the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand you over both or will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. And immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear. See, it didn't help him. He went there because he was terrified. Now he's even more terrified. Filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone for he'd eaten nothing all that day and night. Some people think that he had fasted because it was part of the ritual. Some people think he was just so upset he didn't eat. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now, please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him and he listened to them and he got up from the ground and he sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at her house, so apparently the medium business paid well, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. Okay, now, what observations and applications can we get from this? Well, let's start off with the obvious one. A lot of people have this question. Can the dead communicate with the living? And the answer is no. Not without coffee, they definitely cannot, no. The Bible seems to indicate that this is not allowed. And we get a lot of this from the story Jesus tells in Luke 16. Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus, and the story reveals, first of all, that in this place of the dead, which in the Old Testament is called Sheol, and the New Testament is called Hades, there's a great separation between the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead, and neither can cross the gap. Because the rich man asked for Lazarus to come over, and he's told, no, that doesn't happen. We don't do that here. And this would seem to suggest that the dead are limited in their movements. They can't just go anywhere they want. Secondly, the rich man then asked permission to return to the land of the living to warn his brothers about what waited them in death, and he is refused. The fact he acts for permission suggests it was not something that they could do without permission. They simply couldn't go anywhere they wanted. Third, the scripture makes it clear that this desire to communicate with the dead is something that God finds intolerable. In Leviticus 19 and verse 31, it says, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In Leviticus 20 and verse 6, I will set my face against the person who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute himself by following them, and I will cut him off from his people. Rudyard Kipling, the British laureate, wrote a warning with reference to this very passage of Scripture. He wrote a piece called The Road to Endure. In the very end of that, he says, Oh, the road to endure is the oldest road and the craziest road of all. Straight it runs to the witch's abode as it did in the days of Saul. And nothing is changed of the sorrow in store for such as go down the road to endure. The two biggest problems with speaking with the dead are summarized rather nicely by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 8 and verse 19. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? So we see that, first of all, God wants us to inquire of him, first of all. And secondly, why would the living consult the dead about matters of life? What are the reasons that most people want to communicate with the dead in our culture. Often it's because they want to put to death their, their own fear of death. And they are seeking confirmation that it's possible for them to have a happy afterlife without all that God and Jesus baggage. In fact, many modern movies promote this. Meet Joe Black, What Dreams May Come, Ghost city of angels, and so on and so forth. They all could aptly be renamed how to go to heaven without Jesus. There are those who are interested in a future peace 
and comfort without God in the afterlife, just as they were seeking peace and comfort in this life without God. Spiritualism excludes getting guidance from God because it is more interested in a religion of unrestricted supernaturalism that makes no moral demands on a person. Consequently, there's no repentance required and the grace of God is completely unnecessary. Now, it would be easy for all of us at this point to feel very self-righteous and superior to those knuckleheads that go about trying to seek advice from the dead because we would never do that. But we do seek the advice of the living sometimes on behalf of the living before we go and inquire of God. Do we not? So when Saul sought peace and comfort and assurance from something other than God, that was bad, and it's bad when we do it too. The Lord should be our first response, not our last resort. The second application is if you don't respond to the truth revealed and receive the grace given, you have no one to blame but yourself. The difference between Saul and David is most evident in the way they respond when their sin is revealed. Whenever Saul's sins are revealed, he rationalizes, he makes excuses, he's always guilty with an explanation. And because of that, he never ad really admits his sin, and so because he doesn't admit his sin, he won't commit his sins to the Lord for the Lord's grace and mercy. Whenever David's sins were revealed, although sometimes it took a while, <laughs> he admitted his guilt and then would commit himself to the mercy and grace of God. In other words, David responded when the truth about his sin was revealed, and so he was now in a position to receive the grace and mercy that was offered. And when it came to sin, David never went there too often. He never stayed there too long. Mostly, he drifted. Occasionally, he doubted. On a handful of occasions, his faith was dampened to the point of despair. But usually, when confronted, no matter to what level of disobedience he had descended to, at some point he would repent and return to the Lord. Saul never does this. He always offers excuses, and he is eventually destroyed by his sin. You have heard me say on more than one occasion, the sins you are not broken over, you will be broken by. If there is some sin in your life right now that you are not broken over, the time will come when you will be broken by that sin because that is all sin knows how to do, is to pull us down into destruction. And Saul had waited too long. The weight of his sin kept pulling him ever further downward. It kept dragging him further and further from God until finally, we've also talked about this, if you're unwilling to repent, Long enough, you reach a point where you're unable to repent. And Saul had reached that point. In his stubbornness, he had been unwilling to repent for so long, he now completely lacked the ability to repent, and his sin destroyed him. Whatever you are unwilling to do, if you're unwilling to do it long enough, you will eventually become unable to do. And that's not only true for Saul, that's true for you, and that's true for me. In 1 Chronicles, we're given a quick summation of Saul's downfall. In chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, Saul died. Why? Because he was unfaithful to the Lord. How? He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. It says at the beginning of this story that Saul did try to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord would not answer him. But the reason is, is because Saul would never deal with his sin. He inquired of the Lord without admitting and committing his sins to the Lord. So in that sense, as far as the Lord's concerned, he's not really inquiring of the Lord. 
The third application is, why do people consult the dead on behalf of the living? You remember this guy from the 70s used to be on TV all the time when you're flipping through the channels and you had the psychic network? According to various studies about why people do this, many people in the United States believe that there are a few people who have psychic abilities, including uh, uh, telepathy and clairvoyance. And uh, a recent report sheds light on why some people do believe in this stuff and some people don't believe in this stuff. And in the study, they studied people who were prone to believe in psychics and their abilities and people that were skeptical skeptical of psychics and their abilities, and they took people from the same level of of education, had the same academic performance in school, and found that people who believe in psychic powers are not, generally speaking, analytical thinkers. In other words, they tend to interpret the world through a subjective, personal, intuitive perspective rather than gather their information analytically. In short, they feel their way to the truth. They don't think their way to the truth. And because of that, they can be manipulated in their feelings. So even though psychic claims are often general and vague, people are inclined to believe them because the psychic is saying something that confirms a bias they already have, something they already want to believe. This is known in psychological circles as the Barnum effect. The Barnum effect is a common psychological phenomenon whereby people tend to accept vague general descriptions as uniquely applicable to themselves because they want to believe these vague general descriptions are true of them. And that effect is named, you might have guessed, after P.T. Barnum, the famous circus showman and conman who often used the tool of psychological manipulation on the crowds attending his circus. People are drawn to claims of the ability to speak to the dead because people want to cling to the illusion of a heaven without Jesus, of an afterlife without God. They seek to remove their own fear of death and are comforted by so-called deceased loved ones talking through a medium who show that they are contentedly carrying on in the afterlife without any religious needs or affiliations. Furthermore, people like to have a sense that they're in control, that if they can find out about something that's going to happen, and they don't like what that thing is, they like to think they'll be able to control it if they know about it in advance. Essentially, these charlatan psychics and mediums, they mark it in something called false hope. Occasionally in the Old Testament, there were so-called prophets who offered people false hope. One of the true prophets, Jeremiah, speaks to this in Jeremiah 23, Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares, indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, prophesy lies, prophesy false hopes, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. The Lord goes on to say through the true prophet Jeremiah to these false prophets and those who listen to them, I will bring on you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. And so it is with Saul. The Lord brought him everlasting shame and disgrace that will never be forgotten. We're still talking about it today, all these thousands of years later. You see, Saul never quite figured out that even if the spirit world could provide you with knowledge, it could never provide you with wisdom. And I've noticed that in a lot of time travel movies, it has this premise that if you know something is going to happen, 
you can try to change it. And I think this is basically what Saul is trying to do. He thinks if he knows the battle, how it's going to go tomorrow, then he can somehow, because he knows how it's going to go, that he can change how it goes. But he cannot. And instead, he just seals his own fate with his disobedience and sin. He was unwilling to admit his sins, and so he never committed those sins to the Lord's grace and mercy. He never asked for forgiveness. His unwillingness to repent led to his inability to repent. Paul mentions the possibility of having a seared conscience in 1 Timothy 4. In verse 2, he says, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Earlier in the book of 1 Timothy, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.5 that the goal of this command and the command that he has in mind is the command not to teach false doctrines, false hopes, false lies, is love. And that that comes from a pure heart. It comes from a good conscience. It comes from a sincere faith. And so in that verse, we see that Paul made a connection between authentic faith and a good conscience. In the other verse, in 1 Timothy 4.2, when he talks about consciences that have been seared with a hot iron, we see the reverse, insincere faith, which is actually a rejection of faith, leaves the conscience seared as with a hot iron. In other words, just as the good conscience emerges from authentic faith, this seared conscience emerges from perverted, inauthentic faith. The image of searing something with a hot iron, the Greek word for seared is where we get our medical term to cauterize, which is the searing of body tissue or blood vessels with heat, usually to stop bleeding. And sometimes in the process of cauterizing a wound, feeling will be lost because thick scarring occurs. And Paul's point is that people who traffic in false faith and false doctrine, and false hope, quickly develop thickly scarred consciences so that they can no longer have feelings of remorse or regret. And that is where Saul's sin has left him, in shame, in disgrace, Or as Rudyard Kipling said, the end of the road to endure is sorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Praise Dean can come forward at this time. Lord, as we now consider your word, it's kind of a bizarre little story that we read of today. But there are a lot of lessons there to learn even for us that don't go to mediums and spiritists, we sometimes gather our experts before we go to you. You are often our last resort instead of our first response. After we've tried all these other things to fix our problems or understand our situation, we suddenly think, oh, maybe I should go talk to the Lord about this, when that should have been the very first thing that we did. So we should be careful in being too judgmental of Saul. Of course, there's a lesson in Saul and his refusal to ever admit his sins. The Proverbs say that he who tries to hide a sin will not prosper, and certainly Saul never prospered because he kept trying to hide his sins. And hidden sins cannot be healed. Sins have to be exposed to the light to get healing. We have to come to you in confession and admit that we are off the rails, that we are headed in the wrong direction.
direction. This is sadly where Saul could never, he could never get there in his pride and in his arrogance. David was different. Saul is attempting to try to control his future apart from you, basically. And what we're discovering with David is that he's in a place where he also doesn't know his future. Certainly he has got himself into a mess. But he is learning the lesson of why it is important to patiently wait for the Lord. It's not a lesson that David is learning easily. But he is more receptive to learning that lesson than certainly Saul ever was. And this is why Saul end of his life is found in shame and in disgrace for the end of the road to endure is sorrow but David at the end of his life he is exalted he is loved he experiences the joy of life in you Lord, if there are those here this morning or listening to me online that have been making inquiries about their future and other places besides getting on their knees, Lord, I have found that I often can't get back on my feet until I've gotten down on my knees. And I pray that they will find the courage and strength they need to admit their sins, commit their sins to your grace and forgiveness. And we will be quick to give you the praise and glory for all these things in the precious name of our dear Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ and all God's people said. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stay.